pleasant day to everyone. Welcome to our seventh episode of Cultura Sining at Ibapa. For today's episode, we are going to tackle the topic of contemporary Philippine poetry. And we have uh, for this uh, episode, three guests. All of them are uh, professors of poetry and literature and creative writing in their own respective universities. And I will ask each of them to introduce themselves right now. We begin with um, the person to my right most. I'm Carlo Mardawana. I'm a faculty member at Ateneo de Manila University. Yes, and? Uh, Ned Parfan. I'm teaching at the University of Santo Tomas. And uh, uh, to my left? I'm Ronald Baitan. I teach literature and queer studies at De La Salle University. Yes. Okay, so through three very uh, qualified, very eminent poets and also professors of literature and creative writing and cultural studies in their own schools. And uh, we begin, I suppose, by asking them the question that we uh, always ask our guests who are artists for this show. Uh, I would like them to each describe uh, very briefly their journey into this art form. How did you come to poetry? Or did poetry come to you? All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Um, my initial brush with poetry was actually when I was 12 years old, mm -hmm. and I saw a sheaf, a manuscript actually, uh, of poems. And one of the poems there was by Rolando Harbonell, um, <laughs> Beyond Forgetting. And for a 12 year old, um, that was something. It felt like, wow, this was great. Uh, the language was fantastic. And. Do you still uh, think that way now? Uh, I changed my idea of that poem, uh, but it was my, uh, I would like to say, like my introduction to uh, some, like versification or poetic language. But, um, so I, I said to myself, I could perhaps write a couple of poems. So I wrote about Jesus Christ. That was my first poem. And then from then on, um, I just wrote and wrote mostly love poems. And when I entered the University of Santo Tomas, I wanted to broaden my appreciation for the written word. So I took up literature. And um, I was fortunate enough that during that time, uh, Ophelia Alcantara de Malanta was mm. the dean of the Faculty of Arts and Letters. And he was also a poet. And that was something new to me, an academician um, who was also a, a respected poet. So, I would like to say that my real, my, my beginning uh, instruction to the art form was really at UST through the, uh, through Mampo Fe. So mentorship played a crucial role in, in your decision to make this a, a serious thing for you. Definitely, it was, yes. uh, it was the door that, that, that opened uh, to yes. me. Uh, from someone who graduated from a public high school who didn't know what the sonnet is from uh, Sestina. Mm -hmm. That was uh, that was uh, an eye-opening um, encounter. Did, did, yes. Okay. So thank you, Carlo. Mar That's probably part of uh, what our other guests might want to consider when they talk about their journey: the role of mentorship and formal training, right, in uh, solidifying that this that intuition that this is something you want to do, right? Yeah. So uh, may, may we move now to Ned? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I started um, writing poetry as, um, as a class exercise, actually. Mm -hmm. and, um, it was uh, my English teacher who basically forced me to write poetry because it was going to be graded. And then uh, from then on, I just, you know, I, I kept on writing um, with my uh, father's uh, typewriter. He's a CPA, so he also, had, yeah, so he also had the seal, mm -hmm. so I would type the poems and then I would put the seal to make it official, and it had a letterhead and you know everything. So, yeah, and then I first uh, got published in the high school. Uh, Who was the audience of your earliest poems? My parents. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, and so um, high school, it was the school paper, and then same thing with Carl Lamar at USD. Um, I really. Uh, seriously considered writing poetry for like for the rest of my life when I was in college with the Thomasian Writers Guild under the mentorship of um, Dr. Di Malanta. Okay. It's a history that we share, the three of us in common, because I'm also from USD and she was also my mentor and mm -hmm. we founded, the two of us founded the Thomasian yes. Writers Guild. 
which has produced so many poets. No? And we'll talk about that, why poets and not other kinds of writers. <laughs> why is poetry uh, such an attractive field no? for many young uh, writers no? in UST? OK, now uh, to my left. Okay, uh, I started writing in high school, uh, but I was more interested in fiction until I went to college. Uh, and I watched or saw the film Dead Poet Society. Uh, uh, I think that you know uh, pretty much, you know, sealed uh, the deal. Yes, <laughs> and uh, fortunately, I joined the contest, the literary contest at La Salle, uh, for poetry and fiction, I think, and lost. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Ivasco mm. uh, and uh, Dr. Bobis, uh, Professor Bobis, okay, uh, organized a workshop. Okay, for young writers, so I joined that. Okay, uh, uh, it was my first workshop, and I think after that, you know, I, joined, I became a literature major, and uh, I learned so much more from Dr. Ivasco and Dr. Celia Bautista, mm -hmm. and that started everything, I suppose. She just passed away. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So thank you for all your uh, stories about your journey into the art form. Uh, my own journey uh, into poetry is very similar. I did receive formal training uh, also in college, but I started writing uh, poems much earlier. My first poem I wrote when I was eight or nine years old. It was a poem I wrote for a friend, uh, a girl, whose family transferred neighborhoods, and uh, so I missed her terribly, and I wrote my first poem for her. It was awful. <laughs> It was a love poem of sorts, also uh, my earliest attempt at rhyming and all those wonderful things that you associate with poetry, especially if you're young. And uh, yes, uh, when I uh, reached college and I encountered uh, a real poet, uh, namely Dr. Ofelia Alcantara di Malanta, I realized that this is something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And of course, it it, it was wonderful that I was with a community also of other aspiring poets. And many of us uh, ended up writing poetry seriously and are still writing up to now. So I think crucial in the stories that we all shared is the role of uh, training and mentorship, uh, which I think it's very logical, right? Because in this society, poetry is not really uh, considered practical. It's not really considered uh, profitable. It's not encouraged, I think, by the school system, by and large. And it does make a difference when you have crucial people, figures like real poets, who actually uh, encourage you and um, egg you on to keep writing. So maybe that's the second question we can ask. I mean, uh, poetry is not practical. It cannot be monetized so, so easily. Uh, there are contests, but they, they are few and far between. It's so hard to win them. Mm -hmm. So why keep doing it? What is the pleasure? What is the joy of poetry? Why do you want to keep doing it? Um, foremost, in my case, it was really about being able to inhabit language. That, for me, was poetry. And up, up until today, uh, that's how I deal with poetry, or that's how I um, embrace poetry. Um, that it is an articulation of a different kind, a heightened speech, uh, if you may. So that was its, its attraction to And why, why is that important for you? Um, I felt it, it kind of saved me from my very forsake life, <laughs> that I had that kind of access to mm. something that was uh, expansive, that was, um, that was soul nourishing, if I may say so. Uh, something that was apart from the dailiness of living. So mm -hmm. for me, that kind of uh, saved me in my youth. I had my box, despite the fact that the roofs were leaking and all of that, the, the cats were caterwauling on the roof, but I had my, my poetry. So uh, it was some kind of a, you know, like an oasis from that. An escape, uh, in a way? An, an escape from that life in Galas, Quezon City. Um, that was my, my contact. Um, what would you say, because you're also now an art critic, mm -hmm. uh, you, you go to art shows and exhibit exhibitions and um, galleries and you do reviews, right? Would you say that that sort of need to escape, to look for some, some kind of way out of the prosaicness of reality, is a, a common experience for all artists, not just for poets? Um, 
I would like to think that um, others, um, other poets or other artists, uh, may see their role as something really in tune to, you know, to uh, as some kind of service to society or like a, a personal calling. Uh, for my part, it was really because no I, service for you. No, no service. <laughs> Self serving. Or, so, so, uh, <laughs> it was more like connected to something uh, vaguely spiritual, if I may say so. And perhaps my interest, and I would always say this, my interest in uh, art writing or art criticism is actually fueled by my love for, uh, of poetry because in art writing you need to describe, yes. you need to... It's um, almost ekphrasis in a ekphrasis. way, right? Because so, you are rendering, rendering verbally an experience that is not verbal. Like that, it's visual, it's using another set of... Uh, uh, vocabulary, really, like uh, space and texture and color. And color, the, the visual elements yes. and, and all of that. And part of it was also um, looking into the creative process or the intuition yes. of the artist as he made the work. And with all of that, um, and, and for me, poetry gave me access uh, yes. to that through language. So, so It's um, interesting because it's poetry that gave you some kind of um, uh, um, tool with which to approach other art forms, right? Because you're saying that it's language. That's so, correct. Okay, and, and you render, you can now approach, you can penetrate the world of visual art mm -hmm. with poetry as a kind of foundation. That, that kind of, that was a purpose that poetry served. Um, and in fact, uh, like before uh, writing about art, I was writing for magazines, uh, mm -hmm. journalistic stuff, and mm -hmm. uh, I would like I, I would like to think that poetry kind of helped me um, negotiate those terrains mm -hmm. uh, more effortlessly had I perhaps not had it at the onset. Yes. All right. Now, Ned, uh, why, why do you keep doing this if it's not going to pay the rent? Uh, because I came into it with uh, no, knowing what pleasure it gives me, which is the ability to respond. So wow, our guests are so profound, no? <laughs> to inhabit language, it, to an ability to respond. Okay, can you elaborate? Yeah, like um, in in elementary and high school, you have sabayang pagdikas and you know choral recitation, and then in church you have you know the the church hymns, and then you know also nung panahon ko yung song hits, so mm -hmm. parang mm, kaya ko rin yan. <laughs> <laughs> So just you know being able to respond to to that kind of language, like he said. So, parang hanggang ngayon, natutuwa pa rin ako when I, mm -hmm. whenever I do it, so. Right, but would you recommend a day job for a poet? I mean, if you uh, can't quite make a living out of writing poetry, how do you keep body and soul together? Right? By teaching. By teaching. <laughs> we'll get to that later, no? But let's move now to our uh, next guest. Okay. Uh, what is... Uh, attraction of poetry for you and why do you keep doing it even if it's not practical? Okay. Uh, poetry is spiritual. You know, poetry is, is a, it's a kind of intense language and you don't get that uh, from other uh, genres. No, of course, mm -hmm. the fictions will hate me, right? But uh, <laughs> no, I, I think you know, uh, nothing can be more intense and more uh, compact right, and condensed than poetry. Right, uh, it's philosophical, it's spiritual, emotional. All these things mm -hmm. are there, and that's a challenge. And uh, and I like that. You know, uh, when I'm uh, in pain, when I'm uh, brokenhearted, something like yes. that. No, uh, where do I, I turn to poetry? Yes, there's wisdom. No, and, and what's beautiful about poetry is the way these artists, these poets, have expressed that nugget of wisdom. Yes. So memorably, right? Yes. And I want that, you know. Uh, and in yeah, a way, so there's yeah. something aphoristic about good poetry. You can almost isolate these hugot lines. Yeah. They're now called hugot lines. Yeah, but they're right? not exactly hugot. They're not I mean, hugot because uh -huh. they're not cheap. Yeah. Like it, these wonderful, profound insights, you know, mm. into the human condition, into living itself, into life yeah. itself. Right? The profundity of language. I mean. Yes. Uh, it's profound. I mean, there, there's something profound in poetry, and that's what I like about it. Of course, you don't make money no, by writing poetry. Obviously not. Okay, you teach, right? Uh, I wonder how this episode yeah. will fare because uh -huh. it is on poetry, and 
uh, the audience for poetry is not very huge. Um, I am uh, the director of the UP Press, and our bodega is full of poetry books that have remained unsold uh, over the last 10 years. <laughs> But you see, poetry is important, and I'm reminded of uh, Dr. Tiempo, Edith Tiempo's mm. sort of um, understanding that she communicated to my batch in the Siliman workshop. Mm. If, you, if you are trained as a poet, then all the other genres should come easy, because all the other genres require uh, the same skills that a poet uh, will need to possess. And in poetry, all those skills are intensified and, mm -hmm. and, and distilled into their purest form. So character, setting, plot, all these other elements of fiction are in poetry, except that in poetry, everything is pure and pared down and elemental. And so I agree that basically poetry is sort of more intense mm -hmm. and it's more profound because it's actually more condensed. Um, I, Try to come up with a definition for poetry, because there's so many definitions for poetry. There are poetries, actually, mm -hmm. maybe not just one poetry, mm -hmm. but I think my most sort of capacious definition that might work to sort of uh, contain the other definitions is it's an event in language in which something is transformed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't get any more general than that. Mm -hmm. It's an event in language in which something is transformed and that applies also for fiction, isn't, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Except the event in fiction, the linguistic event, is not probably as important, right? In poetry, it is language or nothing. There's nothing else, really, mm -hmm. but language. Linguistic precision. Yes, and you have concision, you have, you have all these other elements. OK, um, so uh, thank you so much for your thoughts on that. Uh, maybe that will be su sufficient in convincing those who want to be poets that this is worthwhile, despite the fact that it, it will not really pay the rent. But maybe I want to ask our guests now for their uh, evaluation or their appraisal, their thoughts on the state of Philippine poetry now. What are your thoughts on the state of Philippine poetry? Are there, do we have enough poets? Do we have enough readers? Are there enough venues, etc.? All right. Um, when I was just a beginning writer, there were the venues or like the publications that you needed to get published. So there was like the Philippines Free, Free Press, or I'll, I'll repeat that again, Philippines uh, Free Press, Mirror Graphic. Magazine, Graphic, which is still uh, very much around, uh, Sunday Panorama. Empire Magazine, Panorama. But now I would acknowledge the, the, the channels, like the online channels that are available now to the poets today. Um, uh, and uh, that's something that perhaps uh, that's being explored and also uh, independent publishing uh, uh, on, on the other hand. And, and international and publishing. I know, Carla Mar, you've actually uh, been editing mm -hmm. uh, Philippine uh, poetry chapbooks no? for an international press, right? As well as, yes, international publications, yes. like um, specifically countries that are close to us, like Singapore, for Regional, instance, yes, yes. Um, and Hong Kong, for instance, are. In, my, in the case of uh, uh, the project, it was Australia. So yeah. there, there, there seems to be also an interest in So there's the, an expansion of the venues now and, out, and the possible publishers, right, for I would, poetry? I would like to think But that do we have enough Filipino poet, poetry readers, you think? I think... Um, if, you, if you know where they are, tell <laughs> me, because I would want to market <laughs> our books to them. I think the... Um, um, I don't know. I, I think generally there are more poets than readers, <laughs> uh, uh, and um, and the the best. No, that's so sad. Are that's you sure? Uh, I would like to say like the best readers would still be poets. Um, yes. So 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 there. Um, so not maybe yes. We do need probably an imp uh, an improvement in regard to the the readership, right? I think there should that's an area that could be further. Yes. Um, but we can ask Ned that question regarding uh, well the state of, of poetry in the Philippines in general, but also specifically readership, because his first book with UP Press sold out. So maybe he can give us uh, <laughs> share with us his secret. Why why is it that uh, so many other poets aren't so lucky? But you are, you're lucky because now you have a second printing for your first book and your second book is also mm -hmm. selling well. What's your secret? Um, <laughs> well, first your impression on the state of poetry in the country. Oh, okay. Um, 
my impressions. Um, I th I don't know if if we have enough poets or or books or or venues, but I don't think we have enough exposure. I think that's where we are lacking. I I, I don't know how to remedy that. Do we need more book tours? Do we need more? Uh, do we need to expose ourselves more to? Like well, this is one. Schools. This is one way of doing it, right? Mm -hmm. We have an episode devoted mm -hmm. to poetry, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, probably uh, take the campaign online mm -hmm. is one approach, right? But also um, exposure. I'm thinking More poets exposed. are by nature. Poets are by nature solitary, and that's probably what people already understand about poets, and so they really don't want to have much to do with poets, right? But and also most poets are shy. Well, so when if you want writing, exposure, if you're willing if you to expose yourself, books, then you know uh, <laughs> you have to go out there. And <laughs> yeah, I think book tours. I think yeah. it's really the publisher's call. I think publishers of poetry books should take the initiative to push the poetry uh, titles uh, better mm -hmm. and harder, and probably locate the markets because they are there. Like think about our own stories, right? We will, we were just normal people, and then we love poetry. Mm -hmm. Right? And there are many people like us, I would think, right? Young people who are actually thirsting for poetry and they just need to be guided to where to find it. Right? Now, your, your secret, how, how come you sold so many books? I have friends. <laughs> <laughs> I have friends who have teachers. And, Hearty uh, laughter. Uh -huh. uh, so, they, can you elaborate? Because we, we need um, the formula now. They, they, we have to take note to, of that. They, they teach literature or, or poetry or um, some related subjects. And um, I asked them, would you like to um, include my, my book mm -hmm. in your uh, syllabus? So, there. Okay, so it's, it's a good thing to learn that, mm -hmm. in fact, um, and that will be a perfect segue to our question later on, on the day job that's ideal for poets. No? You're, you're a teacher. And because of that, uh, you have students, and students are a ready market to be tapped, right? For good books. Uh, well, maybe it wouldn't sound. Good you didn't sell your you own books to your yeah. students, but then you have friends who are also teachers, and mm -hmm. they were the ones who recommended the book to your students. Yes, so. so that's it. The network that, that being an academe uh, gives you can actually be tapped no? mm -hmm. now to look for the readers. Because our readers are actually ideally students, I'm thinking, right? Uh, they are still uh, ready to be found. They're in schools. They're more or less all captive audiences, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and it would be good to actually provide them quality reading, you know, including good poetry books. And of course, your poetry books are excellent, actually. Thank UP you. Press is the proud publisher of Ned's books. You know? uh, and that we go now to Ronald, who also got published by UP Press. Uh, I'm sorry, we're plugging UP Press. I, I can't be helped. <laughs> okay, uh, what is your impression on uh, the state of Philippine poetry now? Uh, I would like to approach it uh, from different perspectives. No? First, yes. no, uh, readers. No? Uh, there's so much that we can do no? uh, with regard to the market. Why? Because you know, uh, the digital revolution has actually allowed you know, more and more people to tinker with poetry. So many young folks, you know, of different sorts, think that they're going to be poets or that they're poets, and what? Can, and we can do something about that, you know. Uh, we can. That's something we should affirm, right? Yeah, something we should affirm. At the yes. same time, you know, uh, it's something that we should address by, you know, uh, pushing them further to real. <laughs> sorry, I don't like the word real. To real poets. It's, it's though, real poetry. It's as though what they're doing is not real, right? I mean, to, you know, to, serious. to, to more serious, yes. more artistic types yes. of poetry. Yes. Because the, it's there, you know, so many young folks, you know, writing, scribbling, you know, uh, lines of poetry online. And they're not exactly bad. Mm. Diba? Uh, some of them may and be... Maybe, yeah. We should also uh, argue for the idea that there's a continuity yeah. across uh, pop songs, love songs, all these things, and poetry. Yeah, that's what. Right, that's and so we should naturally try to to see the bigger picture. Yeah. And so if you see poetry as this bigger picture, then suddenly the market, the audience, is bigger. Yes, because you know, uh, if you go to Instagram, okay, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Twitter, you know, uh, I've noticed that so many uh, mem uh, users actually uh, t tweet what they think is poetry, right, mm -hmm. or rather their poetic utterances, 
No? Mm -hmm. And I think that's good. No? Uh, you, you can workshop it later, or you can just you know, uh, send them a private Refine message. Refine it. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you know, this is potential. And that's mm -hmm. what I like about it, because this generation has so many options. Mm -hmm. When we were young, Liba, we had to uh, send our manuscript to free press and get rejected. But there's I mean, a downside to the, there yeah. being too many options too, because how do you decide what is excellent now? That's why Everyone becomes his own publisher. You can publish your own poetry now online. Yeah, that, that, it is, uh, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, that's why what, what you can actually address it, right? Mm -hmm. Through, you know, if the, if the system now works, you know, via uh, online, uh, via social media uh, apps, or, or yes, then yes. What, what, what can you do? Then, and why don't we actually promote poetry, you know, yes. using these uh, apps? Actually, I, I was looking at Paris Review and you know, Poetry Foundation. Of course, they don't actually get as many subscribers or followers as all these hunky men, right? <laughs> Mm. Or hot just items. porn sites. No, 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 I mean sexy. I know, think let's just give up thing. on, the, on yeah. the dream that we will ever be as competitive as porn. Uh, uh, <laughs> poetry will always be a niche Porn's market. <laughs> yeah, but still, I mean, mm -hmm. at least you get enough people who are really interested to develop, you know, uh, to yes. hone their craft, yes. you no, know, to come to you, and that's the promise. No, yes. of the digital revolution. I, lo I love yeah. Ronald's take. It's so hopeful, <laughs> right? Because the new technology really is probably the, the only way to go, right? And, and you know, remember, who are the most important, who are, who are, the, mo who are the best selling poets of this decade? Um, I don't know who. Americans. They started out, you know. Uh, they all came from Instagram. I think Lang Liev and uh, the uh, Lang, Rupi Okay, Kaur. those popular ones, the, the, yes. Rupi, I forgot the... the, the not o Ocean Vuong is not. There no. is institution... Okay, now we're identifying, I think, another issue, which is poetry as institutionally validated by, mm -hmm. by academe, by programs, by, by esteemed critics, and then popular poetry. Yeah which is validated by audiences, right? I'm thousands just, of readers. Thousands <laughs> of readers. I'm just going to ask now our guests, which kind of validation do they prefer? Um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not actually something we prepared for in terms of our guide questions, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But because Ronald identified the issue so clearly, mm -hmm. that there is this sort of, um, in a way, this bigger picture, really, that poetry is probably not as esoteric as we, we started out thinking it is, right? Well, according to our journey stories. Actually, there is poetry and it's being consumed and produced. Really, like, who got lines, all of that, right? All of these are intuitions of the poetic. Uh, and there are poets who are actually popular in that realm, mm -hmm. but they have no institutional validation. Uh, and there are poets like Louise Glick and these other big names who are being given Pulitzers, etc. But they are not exactly popular. So, I, in regard to, to your own sort of uh, aspiration, uh, I want to ask our guests which kind of validation they wish for themselves. Okay. Um, to be honest, I would want to have readers, and these uh, <laughs> readers would also theoretically explore also other books of poems, not just mine. So, I, I think top of mind, an honest answer. Um, just to be honest. Just to be honest. I, I, I'm thinking like if I have like 10,000 or 100,000 readers, mm -hmm. and as I mentioned, theoretically, they also not just read me, but other poets as well. But uh, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that entail some kind of compromise too? And that's another question that we can look at mm -hmm. no? that's related to that. And then when the others respond, they can answer as well. Is, you know, you have on one hand expression, your own innermost sort mm -hmm. of like language and your articulation and then you have communication which is the other uh, pole uh, uh, if you appeal to communication then you're going to have more people reading you but if you're going to prioritize expression that's going to be more or less a little exclusive right to those people who, who can who are willing to actually journey with you in that search for expression right so there is a a, a compromise of sorts. You know, the 10,000 readers that you aspire for yourself are readers that you can 
tap only if you cater to the conventions that these readers are actually familiar with and, and expect. And that means actually probably diluting your own idiosyncrasy and your own personal expression. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 you can't have everything, apparently. <laughs> That's correct. Right? I mean, if you um, sell yourself out there, it's like an insipid what? Like Lang Lieb, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. she, that poet stopped pushing all the right buttons. Yeah. That's why, right? And so probably, yes, probably we want a bigger readership, but probably we don't want that to exert uh, pressure that will actually force us to more or less compromise. Right? Yeah, I agree. So with that. maybe there is a middle ground, and we'll see. Okay, so Ned, um, I think it would be debilitating to think about um, numbers and readership. Mm -hmm. you know, when you're when you're writing, you're just you know it, it's better to just write whichever way you want to write, and not think about oh, are they going to like this or mm -hmm. not? Because that's, that that will just happen on its own, I think. So no, it won't. And well, if you're going to write the way you want and you're going to satisfy your own standard, then that's going to be more or less uh, not going to be masa. It's going to be more or less niche and, and quite sort of specialized. Because that's more or less the sensibility, right? The sensibility is to be unique, to be different, to make it new, right? Which of course means not, not to be conventional, not to tap into, not to push the buttons that everyone wants pushed. No, but, but you're being hopeful. Uh, no, I, I was actually surprised when I found snippets of my book on, um, you know, online. Sa, in, was it Instagram or Twitter? So, parang oh, okay. nandun na rin ako. <laughs> no, but, so you're uh, right. You're right. Who's to say? Yeah. Right, oh. Carla Mar. Who's to say? Right. Maybe what we think is actually a little specialized, a little esoteric, actually might resonate. You know, to some people, not a lot. Maybe that's what I'm saying, not a lot. And that is as it should be. Kung a lot kasi, then you're almost going to start asking yourself, what have I done to my poetry? Why am I so masa? Right? Okay. Well. <laughs> Again, it's different. As you see, we're actually talking about our kind of poetry. There is poetry that actually doesn't mind being masa, right? Yeah. Ronald. Mm. I want to have readers, yes, but I want to write the way I want to write. You know? mm -hmm. So I don't, in the end, you know, I don't care as much as I want to be read. You know, I want first I want to be happy with what I'm writing, yeah. and uh, I think it's a matter of. But I want to connect. I think there are not all poems are esoteric. Not all poems are highfalutin. Not mm -hmm. po not all poems are difficult. There are some poems that actually you will be able uh, that, that you know that readers can relate to. Mm -hmm. But why do, why why do our poems end up on Twitter? Mm -hmm. Because there are lines in our mm -hmm. poems that you know uh, young people or ordinary people I can know. relate Ronald, to. Ronald, there right? is like a meme. There was a meme circulating like uh, maybe a month or two ago of hugot lines, and your poems are there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, it's like you've written all these hugot line lines, pala. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I should feel good about that. <laughs> but, you know, actually, the, the point for me is this: no, uh, I'm not the kind of poet uh, who writes difficult poetry, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I think it's the reason why you know uh, some people can you know uh, relate to my poetry and you know quote from mm -hmm. my work, and I, I don't mind it. Right. Uh, I, I think yeah. I think your poems that resonate, all our poems that actually resonate across many readers, would be the more confessional ones, right? Yeah, the ones where actually we talk about ourselves and our own experiences, mm -hmm. you know. And that's why probably the reader, the readers out there actually identify, particularly yeah. if the experiences have something to do with love mm -hmm. and desire and mm -hmm. longing and things like yeah. that that are quite easy to relate to. I think uh, the problem now is that our readers, some of our readers, you know, do not really buy books. That's another thing eh, that we need to address. You know? uh, why do people prefer reading poems online? But th mm. that's for free, right? Yes. And I don't think they have the energy to read an entire collection. You know? Our attention span is, you know, it's just really bungled up. You know? we, can only take, we can take only one poem at a mm. time. You know, uh, we're not uh, 
interested, I mean, at least our audience, no, is not really interested in reading uh, a collection or something, mm -hmm. and definitely not, your, not the difficult ones, mm -hmm. right? Ako, just write whatever you want to write, diba? and, uh, and the audience will come to you. It depends, no? Uh, but it's so wonderful what you said, that you basically satisfy yourself, first and foremost. So you write, and you want to feel happy about what you've written, and uh, you don't really worry too much about whether you'll be read. You know? And if, it's, if you are read, and if you end up being liked, and uh, trending somewhere, then mm -hmm. it's a bonus already, right? Mm -hmm. It's not something you actually uh, desired from the get-go. It's just something that happened. So that's, that's probably one of the miracles, I think, no? of, of art, really, is that it will find its audience somewhere, somehow. Okay, now, since we're running out of time, we only have a few minutes left, um, we're going to just cover probably two more questions mm -hmm. that I think are quite important. The first one has to do with um, um, the idea of like cliques, right? Or groupings of poets. Because we're pretty solitary as creatures. That's something we established mm -hmm. early on, like in our cuento about our journeys. Um, we we uh, happen uh, into poetry or we, we uh, journey into poetry more or less alone. And then we start writing and then we become identified with certain other group, uh, other poets, and we form, wittingly or not, barcadas or cliques or groups. Uh, that's the impression that, that some readers have, is that there are more or less writing schools, writing cliques or groups in the country. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is that impression a valid one, or is it just uh, a misimpression or a false impression? Um, I, I think the, the cliques would originate from the, the university, like yes. in the right uh, in the guilds, in yeah. the writing organizations, in the school papers, the right? school papers, yes. and then ones who uh, go beyond the, the walls of the university into the workshops, and then, and then the workshops generate their own cliques, cliques right? and batches. So I'm thinking it's really just a you know a small instant community. Uh, that you, you generate a lot. Well, it's not something we, we actually intended. It's just part of the structural sort of setup of everything is that you're going to end up having more or less groups, right? That's correct. Like, for instance, like, uh, my affiliation would be, um, I'd be the foremost. You're a Tomasian poet. A Tomasian poet, <laughs> first and foremost. But now you're uh, teaching that today, so you're also that today a poet. And um, I studied my <laughs> MFA at La Salle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and now um, you're in a UP show. In, in a UP show. <laughs> So, um, You're so promiscuous. <laughs> first published by UP Press. And first published, oh, you are a UP Press poet. Again, about to be. Um, yes, yes. So that's really a result of just how things are set up. Right? But I think that the question on cliques also has to do with whether those cliques end up behaving in certain undesirable ways. Let, let's say, if members of a clique uh, uh, judge in the palanca one year, are they going to make another member of their clique win? Mm -hmm. Things like that. I think that's the, 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 that's, the, that's the essence of that kind of suspicion no? that some mm -hmm. people have mm -hmm. about poetry cliques. No? Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking, because poetry is so, so impractical and non-monetizable, and it's such a lonely enterprise to be a poet, I think we're entitled to have cliques. Clicks. I'm sorry, they become support systems and they become our friends, you know, and we read each other and we pat each other on the back when we need the pat, right? Um, but it's also, I think, not true that, that the cliques actually determine the results of these contests, right? Because what's good about the palanca is that every year the, the ch judges will change. And if you don't win this year, just enter it again next year. <laughs> and that's happened a lot, right? The poets actually, and other, in the other uh, genres, also they keep just entering the same piece and then they will find the right composition of judges that will like the work finally. But okay, your impression on that question, uh, your thoughts on that question, sorry. Um, he brought up the, the um, being a Thomasian poet and um, I was actually surprised when uh, the anthology uh, Crowns and Oranges came out, um, edited by Dr. Cyril Bautista and Ken Ishikawa. And uh, one of the first uh, critiques of that anthology that I read was from 
uh, Adam David, and he said, um, he noticed something about Thomasian poets, and that's the excess of imagery. And we had no idea na yung ginagawa namin. Parang nahawal lang kami sa isa't isa. So parang, ah, that's right. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so um, it kind of defines you as well. And uh, also, I think it's a good sign that there are clicks. Because there are, there are totoo naman. And it's good kasi, ibig sabihin, we still don't have one definition mm -hmm. or one way of writing poetry. Yeah, so it's, it's a democracy. Still, yeah, yeah, so I, I like that. No, mm -hmm. na, um, kung if uh, a member of one clique um, happens to judge a palanka, then he will decide based on his beliefs of how poetry should be written, for mm -hmm. example. So. In the end, it's a matter of taste, isn't it? Particularly in regard to these contests. Mm -hmm. You will, in fact, gravitate towards the poetry you, you yourself wish to write. Mm -hmm. you know? Or enjoy reading. And enjoy reading, mm -hmm. yes. So cliques are unavoidable, in my opinion. Whoever's asking that question has to ask himself, uh, you are probably part of a clique too, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And cliques uh, actually have been sort, sort of like a feature of the Philippine literary scene. No? There have been studies of the literary barcada. Uh, you have the Veronicans, you have the Ravens, you have mm -hmm. all these different groups, no? UP Writers Club, etc. And the Tomasian Writers Guild, you know. And La Salle will have its own uh, La Salle community of writers and readers. No? Mm -hmm. They're doing a wonderful job. They're now churning out so many award-winning writers. Uh, mm -hmm. your, your program, your creative writing program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, including uh, Carlo Bar here. Uh, no, the two of them. <laughs> this is a La Salle show, sorry. It's not a UP show. Pala. Okay, uh, yes. Clicks. There's nothing wrong with having clicks in the community. Yes. Yeah, I want variety. Yes. No, I want a critical dialogue yes. okay, amongst you know, poets yes. you know, of different you know, And actually, styles, one, of the, good, one of the good effects of mm -hmm. cliques is that actually, particularly in the Philippine poetic scene, it's the poets who have been va the vanguards of pushing the envelope as far as critical discussion or discourse is concerned. There have been so many literary and aesthetic debates already in the history of Philippine literature and English, and they have mostly been led by the poets, right? Because the poets have cliques, precisely. <laughs> they have, more or less, they have uh, uh, support systems. They can actually risk having an opinion, right? Because they know that they will have people who will, more or less, share their own opinion. Now, since we have uh, a very little time left, it's, uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask each of our guests to, leave, uh, some, to give us some parting words, uh, words of wisdom, words of advice. <laughs> to our audiences. The potential audience of, a, of this episode of the, of the Cultura Sining at Ibapa show would be students and teachers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in the different universities of the country. So uh, maybe you want to address them now? All right. Um, poetry is a difficult craft, and, but it has infinite rewards. So for those who would like to venture into this art form, um, there are many books, there are many uh, sources to consult, but at the end of the day, it's you and the, the blank page, and um, it's really just pushing yourself and uh, and getting in touch with yourself and using language to um, to to anchor yourself into onto the page, and hopefully uh, that ends up uh, results into a, a poem. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I guess my advice would be. Um, to be open to criticism, um, to hone the craft by reading more, reading extensively, um, and uh, not to be daunted by uh, what seems to be a, a difficult poem, because there's always a way of reading uh, yeah. a poem. And um, yeah, and defy your teachers sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a halt to defiance from uh -huh. Ned and our. Uh, Professor from La Salle. Mm, to the young readers, write your life. Use poetry to inscribe the self and to affirm the self. And the, the good news is that there are so many um, institutions or centers you know, uh, that can help you. We, <laughs> advertising, at the BMA Dance Science Creative Writing Center, yes. at the UP Institute I forgot, of Creative uh, Writing. I uh, yeah. forgot, uh, 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 Professor uh -huh. Baitan is also the current director of the Bienvenido Santos Creative Writing Center. That's the Creative Writing Institute of La Salle. Yeah, we have one at UP, at UST. Yes. 
the, the, so the, the support is here. There, there are big universities now have creative writing programs and centers, and poetry is always part of any kind of creative writing program. Yeah, um, learn the craft. You know, don't be uh, do not be disappointed if people give you a critique your critique your work. Just you know, uh, be true to your calling, and you'll be all right. Mm. Yes. Well, uh, my own words. Parting words would be that poetry is the genre of the private life. Mm -hmm. It is actually mm -hmm. when you write a poem mm -hmm. or when you read a, a poem, you're actually meant to become the speaker of that articulation. Mm -hmm. And so it's one way to actually incarnate yourself, you know, uh, again and again when you read the poems written by many different people. If you're not quite happy with your own life, read poems. <laughs> poems will, will afford you that experience of becoming someone else. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank all our guests and I'd like to ask our audiences to stay tuned for our next episodes of Kultura Sinya Tibapa. Maraming salamat po at magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon everyone. I'll be reading a poem titled W from my forthcoming collection, The Elegant Ghost. W. We are two men in a boat. Except the water resides in the vessel, sloshing over the curved porcelain edge. Later, we shall have salted it to sea. The shower curtain billowing out, we put the seven oceans to shame for the distance that we cross. Thanks to the earth's magnificent engine, the lamp throwing a towel of light by the bathroom door we left ajar is our sole source of illumination. You have always wanted it half dark. Here, your nakedness is the one thing permanent, total like imperialism. I trace your ribs like the ladder of a song whose final note culminates in the hollow of your throat. It's always been there, a gift. To show our goodwill, we barter kisses. Lacquered boxes lined with expensive silk. I open them like a rich man, and each time I find a scrawl of paper written with brushstrokes of calligraphy. What I understand is your name you brought all the way from Hiroshima. You pressed on the palm of my hand. Do I love you more than your body? It's not a question, but an instruction. So you rode me towards the borders of my skin, taut with nerve endings. We are swimmers now, breaking surface tension. Our pores glitter, our fingers prune. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Ronald Baitan. I'm going to read a poem titled uh, Distance from my first book of poetry, The Queen Sings the Blues. Distance. Tonight, you are walking in another world. I press my hand to my face, my arms and armpits, knees and legs, hoping to find traces of you in my body. But you have been gone for months, and countless showers have expunged you from my body. I look all around me, the books, the pillows, the tapes, our pictures, and the room can only declare with such clarity your absence. Perhaps you two are alone in a solitary room too big for one person, dreaming of the voice that has kept you warm for many years, or the face you have memorized constantly with your fingers. Perhaps truth is not that sweet. You are in a bar too small for 50. Your lips pressed against the cold mouth of a glass of beer. And you have ordered another one for the man sitting just across the bar. And his grin says he likes you. In my mind, you are present in all things. But the bed betrays me. It remains half full. 
The quilt of your voice stretches across the continents, but it cannot keep me warm enough. Love is all proximity and nothing, not even the thought you are thinking of me, can equal your return. Good afternoon. This is from my second book, Tilt Me and I Bend, published by UP Press, 2017. The title is Crime Fiction. We are citizens of the dark matter. You left me dripping in your city of rain. No hard feelings. Yes, hard feelings. If the night is a figure in an alley holding a knife, hide. I am touchy and it is raining in the city. When I look at you, I become aware of my wet clothes clinging to the weakness inside. I hang awkwardly in your story, and inside me the dark matter goes ting like a cash register on a rainy night. Somebody calls it mixed feelings, but no hard feelings. Yes, it's so hard, hard as the city against the rain of possible descriptions. Nobody dies tonight. Nobody eats rats in dark bedrooms tonight. You are my danger and the sentence is wet. And you are the vessel of all the math equations I failed to solve in school, anatomy without visual aids, private as the function of the dark matter I keep mentioning to you about. I am touchy and I have hard feelings. Falling is a private dagger. I feel dangerous when you look at me. I don't like that feeling. <laughs>